There's no need for all that. Schmendrick spoke lightly, making himself laugh. I doubt I could turn you back if you wished it. Nikos himself never could turn a human being into a unicorn. And you are truly human now. You can love and fear and forbid things to be what they are and overact. Let it end here, then. Let the quest end. Is the world any worse for losing the unicorns? And would it be any better if they were running free again? One good woman more in the world is worth every single unicorn gone. Let it end. Marry the prince and live happily ever after. The passageway seemed to be growing lighter, and Schmendrick imagined the red bull stealing towards them, grotesquely cautious, setting his hooves down as primly as a heron. The thin glimmer of Molly Grew's cheekbone went out as she turned her face away. Yes, said the Lady Amalfia, that is my wish. But at the same moment, Prince Lear said, no. The word escaped him as suddenly as a sneeze, emerging in a questioning squeak, the voice of a silly young man mortally embarrassed by a rich, terrible gift. No, he repeated, and this time the word told in another voice, a king's voice, not haggard, but a king whose grief was not for what he did not have, but for what he could not give. My lady, he said, I am a hero. It is a trade, no more, like weaving or brewing, and like them, it has its own tricks and knacks and small arts. There are ways of perceiving witches and of knowing poison streams. There are certain weak spots that all dragons have and certain riddles that hooded strangers tend to set you. But the true secret of being a hero lies in knowing the order of things. The swineherd cannot already be wed to the princess when he embarks on his adventures, nor can the boy knock at the witch's door when she is away on vacation. The wicked uncle cannot be found out and foiled before he does something wicked. Things must happen when it is time for them to happen. Quests may not simply be abandoned. Prophecies may not be left to rot like unpicked fruit. Unicorns may go unrescued for a long time, but not forever. The happy ending cannot come in the middle of the story. The Lady Amalthea did not answer him. Schmendrick asked, Why not? Who says so? Heroes, Prince Lear replied sadly. Heroes know about order, about happy endings. Heroes know that some things are better than others. Carpenters know grains and shingles and straight lines. He put his hands out to the Lady Amalthea and took one step towards her. She did not draw back from him, nor turn her face. Indeed, she lifted her head higher, and it was the prince who looked away. "'You were the one who taught me,' he said. "'I never looked at you without seeing the sweetness of the way the world goes together, or without sorrow for its spoiling. I became a hero to serve you, and all that is like you. Also to find some way of starting a conversation.' But the Lady Amalthea spoke no word to him. Pale as lime, the brightness was rising in the cavern. They could see one another clearly now, each gone tallowy and strange with fear. Even the beauty of the Lady Amalthea drained away under that dull, hungry light. She looked more mortal than any of the other three. The bull's coming, Prince Lear said. He turned and set off down the passageway, taking the bold, eager strides of a hero. The Lady Amalthea followed him, walking as lightly and proudly as princesses are taught to try to walk. Molly Grew stayed close to the magician, taking his hand as she had been used to touching the unicorn when she was lonely. He smiled down at her, looking quite pleased with himself. Molly said, let her stay the way she is. Let her be. Tell that to Lear, he replied cheerfully. Was it I who said that order is all? Was it I who said that she must challenge the Red Bull because it will be more proper and precise that way? I have no concern for regulated rescues and official happy endings. That's Lear. 
but you made him do it, she said. You know that all he wants in the world is to have her give up her quest and stay with him. And she would have done it, but you reminded him that he's a hero. And now he has to do what heroes do. He loves her, and you tricked him. I never, Schmendrick said. Be quiet, he'll hear you. Molly felt herself growing light-headed, silly with the nearness of the bull. The light and the smell had become a sticky sea in which she floundered like the unicorns, hopeless and eternal. The path was beginning to tilt downward into the deepening light, and far ahead Prince Lear and the Lady Amalthea went marching along to disaster, as calmly as candles burning down. Molly grew snickered. She went on, I know why you did it, too. You can't become mortal yourself until you change her back again, isn't that it? You don't care what happens to her or to the others just as long as you become a real magician at last, isn't that it? Well, you'll never be a real magician, even if you change the bull into a bullfrog, because it's still just a trick when you do it. You don't care anything about magic, but what kind of magician is that? Schmendrick, I don't feel good. I have to sit down. Schmendrick must have carried her for a time, because she was definitely not walking, and his green eyes were ringing in her head. That's right. Nothing but magic matters to me. I will round up unicorns for Haggard myself if it would heighten my power by half a hair. It's true. I have no preferences and no loyalties. I have only magic. His voice was hard and sad. Really? she asked, rocking dreamily in her terror, watching the brightness flowing by. That's awful. She was very impressed. Are you really like that? No, he said, then or later. No, it's not true. How could I be like that and still have all these troubles? Then, he said, Molly, you'll have to walk now. He's there. He's there! Molly saw the horns first. The light made her cover her face, but the pale horns struck bitterly through hands and eyelids to the back of her mind. She saw Prince Lear and the Lady Amalthea standing before the horns, while the fire flourished on the walls of the, of the cavern and soared up into the roofless dark. Prince Lear had drawn his sword, but it blazed up in his hand and he let it fall and it broke like ice. The red bull stamped his foot, and everyone fell down. Schmendrick had thought to find the bull waiting in his lair, or in some wide place with room enough to do battle, but he had come silently up the passageway to meet them, and now he stood across their sight, not only from one burning wall to the other, but somehow in the walls themselves and beyond them bending away forever. Yet he was no mirage but the red bull still steaming and snuffling, shaking his blind head, his jaws clamping over his breath with a terrible wallowing sound. Now, now is the time, whether I work ruin or great good, this is the end of it. The magician rose slowly to his feet, ignoring the bull, listening only to his cupped self as to a she seashell, but no power stirred or spoke in him. He could hear nothing but the far, thin howling of emptiness in his ear, as old King Haggard must have heard it waking and sleeping and never another sound. It will not come to me. Nikos was wrong. I am what I seem. The Lady Amalthea had stepped back a pace from the bull, but no more and she was regarding him quietly as he pawed with his front feet and snorted greatly, rumbling grainy blasts out of his vast nostrils. He seemed puzzled about her and almost foolish. He did not roar. The Lady Amalthea stood in his freezing light with her head tipped back to see all of him. Without turning her head, she put her hand out to find Prince Lear's hand.